Hey y'all, Data Guy here. And today I have a video for you where I wanna go through the nine principles of good data architecture. I figured first day of the year, uh, first working day for me, and I wanna go through kind of, you know, how you should plan your next project, your next data architecture, and go through what are, you know, kind of the commonly accepted nine principles for designing a resilient, scalable, and evolvable data system. Um, and good architect data architecture, it's not about the best tools, it's about making decisions that are going to be durable and are going to enable your team to move fast without breaking the platform. Um, so without further ado, let's get into it. Now, the first principle I wanna talk about is the principle of choosing common components wisely. And what this means is that, you know, every shared component becomes infrastructure gravity, right? Once it's adopted, it's gonna shape the direction of your organization and who you can hire, the operational complexity of those systems, um, and also future architecture decisions because, you know, your core infrastructure, something let's say you choose, you know, Airflow as your orchestrator, then you need to only, you know, really, you're gonna be confined to systems that can integrate well with Airflow. Um, and why this matters is, you know, share components are going to help amplify both success and mistakes, right? So over standardization, if you just say, hey, everything needs to use this very small set of tools, it's going to slow innovation. It's also going to, you know, make it so you basically have a lot of different use cases crammed into tools that might not support all those use cases, right? So, you know, you don't necessarily want to choose common components for every single piece of your structure, but under standardization and you know saying hey i don't care what orchestrators used across the organization creates chaos because then you know hey maybe one team is using parquet one team is using iceberg another team use, is using delta at lake as their storage format and it makes it really hard for you to integrate all those different silos together into one shared kind of data mesh um you know an approach that's getting especially uh, more popular in this day and age so other, you know, common components you would think about, right, that you'd want to find an organization are things like, hey, are you using Kafka or PubSub for you know, your messaging queues? What kind of database do you want to standardize on? Snowflake, BigQuery, Postgres, um, your observability stack. Typically, you know, you'll want to have one observability stack for an entire organization. Um, and also things like IAM and secrets management, right? You know, having one common manager for roles and uh, secrets and all sensitive values makes it a lot easier to keep those done securely. Um, and how you want to apply this in quite in practice is you know ask these questions before you start standardizing right is this boring and stable does it scale organizationally not just technically um, does it integrate well with the rest of my tool stack um, and is it easy to operate for both new and experienced users um, and a good rule of thumb here is you know standardize where consistency matters and then allow choice where experimentation matters um, and you know, choose a tool. And choosing a tool because it's powerful rather than operationally mature is a common pitfall for people, right? Um, that's an area where, hey, you get you know shiny object syndrome. You think, hey, this cool new tool, it's super powerful. It's going to change our business. You really want to take a step back and make sure is that true. Evaluate that and make sure, hey, this is actually going to be something that everyone can use, not just for the specific use case. Now, the next principle of good data architecture is planning for failure. And what this means is, you know, failures are not edge cases. They're going to happen at some time, um, and they're really normal operating conditions. You need to build systems that can deal with failures. Um, you know, the most types of, most common types of failures you're, you're probably going to need to assume are things like network partitions, partial writes, duplicate events, uh, schema drift downstream system outages, obviously human error, the classic, um, and also cloud provider incidents, as we've seen a couple times this year, especially if you're an AWS uh, East One. And good architectures will assume, hey, retries are going to happen. There's going to be failures. Data is going to arrive late. Date, jobs are going to need to be rerun. Messages will be duplicated. Dependencies are going to break. And you need to implement concrete practices to achieve that. So in you know, this case, for something like a disaster recovery, build a system that can identify and confirm the occurrence of a system failure, initiate a backup and a, you know, automate a restore process. It's one example of kind of putting this into practice. Um, but other examples are things like, hey, item potent rights, have rights that check to make sure that for uniqueness, um, exactly once semantics, um, you know, dead letter queues, so you actually trap um, and kind of isolate bad data, um, replayable pipelines, right, so that when you inevitably need to, you know, rerun something, you have that option. Uh, backfills as first class citizens is also really important. You know, if you're able to rerun failed jobs with, you know, after you fix the issue, it's really powerful. Um, and also explicit retry and timeout policies are really good for getting around a lot of those, you know, kind of dumb failures like, hey, the API rate limit, you know, timed out, so you just need to retry it a little bit later. 
Um, and if a system can't fail safely, it's not gonna be able to scale. That's really what you wanna think about um, when you're thinking about this principle. Now, the next principle I wanna talk about is, you know, the architecting for scalability. And what this means is, you know, scalability isn't just handling more data, it's handling more teams, it's handling more use cases, uh, it's handling more velocity, more ambiguity, and, you know, horizontal and vertically scaling, right? So those are the two main dimensions, right? Do you either need to increase or decrease the capacity of existing services or instances, or you need to add more services um, and add more r machines to handle load, right? And then in you know, terms of how this kind of breaks down into dimensions of scalability, right? So, you know, what's typically going to break with data volumes, really high data volumes is storage and compute. What typically is going to need to scale with team count is, you know, ownership, coordination, IAM systems. Um, pipeline count, orchestration and visibility. Uh, data consumers, having really de well-defined data contracts and trust. If you don't have those, commonly going to run into issues as you scale. Um, also, things like change velocity, right? Making sure you have really good schema and governance systems um, to make sure that, hey, when you're scaling, you're tracking and managing all those changes well. Um, and key strategies here are choosing, hey, horizontal versus vertical scaling. Typically, horizontal scaling is going to be the better option there. Um, stateless compute is also a really great option, right? So compute that, you know, just spun up on demand when a task needs to be done, isn't sitting idly. Um, things like partition-aware designs, right? Planning for really large data volumes and planning for how you're going to partition that data from day one. Um, or scheme evolution strategies as well, right? Planning, hey, how are we going to track schema changes to do change data capture? Um, and also kind of throughout all of them is, you know, clear data ownership boundaries um, to make sure that everyone knows exactly what they own and what they're responsible for. Um, and, you know, the real, I'd say, anti-pattern people fall into here is, you know, saying, hey, let's just make it bigger instead of let's make it more modular, um, which is typically the better approach when you're trying to scale a system. Now, the next two principles I kind of want to put together, um, and they are that architecture is leadership and always be architecting, ABC. So the first one, architecture is leadership. Really what I mean here is that architecture isn't just, you know, kind of what you see on the right, really, where it's, you know, hey, just, you know, visual representations of how you're designing systems. It also needs to include things like setting clear technical direction, you know, defining, hey, where are we a microservices first organization? Do we make monolithic applications? Define how you're making trade-offs, right? What are the trade-offs you commonly want? You know, where do you want people to optimize for? What are you going to say no to, right? You know, what should you not include in your architectures? Um, and help reduce the cognitive load for teams because, you know, by saying, hey, this is what you should be doing, this is how you're architecting, really reduces the scope of, hey, this is what I need to design for rather than having them decide for themselves. Um, and it's really just about creating, you know, more paved roads and clearly defined pathways to success rather than guardrails. Um, and strong architecture leadership means you're enabling teams instead of blocking them. You know, you're balancing short-term delivery with long-term health and really communicating the why, right? Not just the what, but why you're doing this, why you are microservices forward, why you're, you know, more micro batch forward, things like that. Um, and real architecture lives in things like defaults, templates, standards, CICD pipelines, uh, platform tooling, right? It's a combination of both documents and the actual, you know, kind of implementation and codification of those standards. Now, what I mean by always be architecting is that architecture is never done, right? Data systems are living systems. And you can even see this, you know, at a really large scale with the evolution of, you know, from the 90s with enterprise data warehouses and cubes, all the way to cloud, you know, lake houses, data lakes, data meshes. Um, and really what, you know, the point is here is why this matters is you need to be able to design your systems to evolve as new tools come out, right? Requirements are going to evolve. Data sources are going to change. Scale is going to increase if your business is doing well. Teams are going to reorganize, maybe if your business isn't doing well. Um, and also, priorities are going to shift within the business, right? You know, maybe you need a data mesh today, and maybe that gets prioritized in five years, right? And so, practical behaviors you can use to implement this are things like regular architecture reviews, um, you know, community or having logs of your tech debt and tracking tech debt over time. Um, also, having sunset plans for pipelines, right? Having plans to take pipelines out of circulation. Um, things like ongoing refactoring, too. Uh, making sure, you know, you have systems where you're constantly reevaluating and optimizing pipelines and, and your stack um, and keeping metrics and architecture health as well. And healthy teams are going to ask things like, hey, what assumptions no longer hold? Where is complexity creeping in? Um, you know, what can we simplify this quarter? Um, and an ANSI pattern you want to avoid here is, you know, treating architecture as a one-time design phase, right? This isn't something you just set and forget. It's something you constantly monitor and evolve over time. Now, the next principle I want to talk about is building loosely coupled systems. 
And what this means is systems should coordinate but not depend on each other. Tight coupling, you know, like you see on the left, right, is things like shared databases, implicit schemas, hidden dependencies, synchronous chains across teams. And if you know one team changes something, everything breaks. Versus loose coupling, you have explicit contracts, you have event-driven communication, version schemas that can evolve over time, asynchronous workflows that don't rely just on scheduling, um, and clear ownership boundaries so everyone knows what they need to maintain and what they're responsible for. And some practical techniques for implementing this are implementing things like data contracts or event schemas in something like Avro or Protobuf, um, domain-oriented pipelines, or iceberg and delta tables that have evolution rules built in. Um, and change data capture instead of direct reads is a really great way to make sure you're tracking how things are changing over time as well. And a good rule of thumb here is that if one team can break another team's pipeline without knowing it, that system is too tightly coupled. Now, the next thing I want to talk about, and the seventh principle, is to make reversible decisions or two-way door decisions, right? What this means is that most of your architectural decisions should be easy to undo, right? You shouldn't be implementing things that are super irreversible unless absolutely necessary. Um, you know, irreversible decisions include things like, hey, choosing a new data format, um, partitioning strategies, choosing a different primary storage layer, choosing different core orchestration models. And these require you know, a lot of extra scrutiny to make sure, hey, this is actually necessary and is going to help our business rather than just being something, hey, because I saw a shiny new tool. Um, and reversible decisions should be abstracted, configurable, have migration paths that can be gone forward or back in, um, and avoid vendor lock-in where possible because that's a really big way to make a decision irreversible is if you know, you're putting everything in a black box system that you don't really understand. Um, and then some techniques here are for implementing are you know, doing things like storage ab abstraction layers, having well-versioned schemas, um, dual write migration strategies are good too. Um, also, feature flags for pipelines, so you can turn you know, new features or new uh, steps in pipelines off and on at will. Um, and also, blue-green data deployments are really uh, you know, efficient for this as well. Um, and you know, I think a good framing of this, and from Jeff Bezos, <laughs> of all people, is you know, one-way doors require deep thinking, two-way doors require speed, and things you can at rapidly iterate on. Now, the eighth principle I want to talk about is prioritizing security. Security should not be an add-on that you layer on top of your data architecture. It is the architecture, right? The way you're designing your systems should be secure. Um, and core data security concerns in data systems are things like data access control, secrets management, encryption at rest and in transit, uh, auditability, least privilege access controls, um, regulatory compliance. And a good security architecture is going to include things like a centralized IAM system, row and column level security, service to service auth, secret rotation on regular schedules, and immutable audit logs so you know who has made what changes at all times. Um, and you know, really, whatever risk you want, you know, you want to go through and identify what are the particular risks for my business, and implement controls and testing to make sure that those are covered for. Um, and a common mistake is, you know, hey, bolting security on after a platform is in production. Do it at the start um, because a single misconfigured bucket can undo years of engineering work if it's you know exposed to some bad actor, right? Um, so really important to from day one design with security in mind. Now, the final principle I have to talk about is embracing FinOps. Um, and as much as everyone hates this and hates dealing with when finance says, hey, you can't buy this cool new tool, cost is really a first class architectural constraint, right? FinOps matters in data because data workloads can scale in visibility and cloud makes overspending really, really easy. And inefficient pipelines can compound over time, uh, you know, really without anyone recognizing it. So a FinOps aware architecture makes that cost very visible, right? Attributes that cost to different teams or domains, make sure every piece, every dollar is accounted for and tracked and encourages efficient data usage because if your you know, consumption is tracked, you're probably gonna be more efficient with it. Um, and that really helps to align incentives with behavior where you know, you're incentivized to keep your costs low so you can use other tools or do other things with that excess cost that you've saved. Um, and some practical practices to implement this are doing things like cost tagging by pipeline, usage-based chargeback models, um, especially for large organizations, things like query cost controls where, uh, you know, really expensive queries are automatically rejected um, or, you know, ask for further, you know, ask to be optimized if it identifies a way to optimize it. Um, tiered storage strategies, you know, where you put, le you know, less used data in archivals, cheaper archival storage is really useful too. Um, and, you know, retention and lifecycle policies where you're not keeping data in, you know, in ad nauseum, but you're actually going setting an end of life of when that data is no longer needed um, and can be deleted. So you're saving that storage space. Um, but those are all the different principles for designing good data architecture that I want to talk about today. Hope you enjoy this video. I hope you learned something and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Data guy out.